Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History, World History Edition is this time we get ready to take apart a word that literally means separateness, apartheid, apartheid. Let's see if we can't wrap our heads around this racial discriminatory policy of South Africa that lasted for more than 50 years. So kids in school, lifelong learners in Craig Cree and the internet, get ready as we go giddy up for the learning and go get her done right now. So guys, before we get to apartheid, and again, this is going to be a word that literally means separateness. This is a policy enacted by the National Party of the South African Nation in 1948. But there's history before that that's important because it's a different history than a lot of other British colonies, and that's what uh, South Africa was for a long time. But before the British came, there were Portuguese. We won't talk about the Portuguese, but the Dutch, the Dutch East India Company, which is gonna discover Cape Town, again, geography, this awesome port on the southern tip of South Africa in the mid-1600s, they saw it as a refreshment colony, a place where their sailors, their merchants could stop on the way to making these awesome trade deals around the world. Now, the Dutch are going to settle there. They're going to be called Boers. They speak Afrikaan, and that is a West Germanic language. So that's a different ethnic heritage history, the Dutch settlers, than the British when they come in the next century. Now, the Dutch are certainly going to have their own problems other than the British. They're going to be the Cape Frontier Wars when they're fighting the indigenous people that live in the inland to this port that they have discovered and they're living around. But the British are going to roll in around 1800, and they're steadily going to take control of the colony. And then eventually, we're going to have the Boer Wars between the Anglos, the British, and the Dutch. But eventually, long story short, the British are going to create this as a colony coexisting existing with the Boers, the Dutch colonists that came before them, and then really treating blacks, indigenous blacks, as the others, putting them on reserves, fighting them. There's going to be the Anglo-Zulu Wars, and there's also a long legislative colonial history of uh, racial laws that are going to segregate, disenfranchise, and treat blacks different. Before we get to the Union of South Africa in 1910, we would characterize it by saying there's a strong master-slave kind of thing going on in South Africa. So as South Africa forms as a nation, racial segregation isn't going to be a new thing. It's going to be reinforcing an old thing. You have to remember the whites putting together, the Anglos, the British, and the Dutch, make up a small fraction of the general population of the people of that land. Maybe they're 15% to 85% but they're gonna control 85% of the land. So certainly there is racial history to be known. Um, now, even though slavery was banned by the British Empire in 1833, they're gonna have an indentured servant system. There's a pass law system where black people had to have passes if they were traveling anywhere into the colony. So they're definitely being treated as outsiders before we get to the Union of South Africa. And that's eventually what we get to. In 1910, the Union of South Africa is formed it's a dominion of the British Empire, and then slowly it's going to achieve its own independence. But it's a country by 1910. So let's take a quick look at kind of the legislative history of racial stuff before we even get to apartheid in 1948. So hip hip hooray, we're going to take the different colonies, and in 1910 we're going to combine them into South Africa, the Union of South Africa. So this is pre-apartheid. In 1910, we get the South African Act, which is going to ban black representation in parliament. It's gonna fully enfranchise the white race. They're now in charge of the other races. And then a series of acts like the Native Land Act, the Natives and Urban Areas Act, the Urban Areas Act, is basically going to forcefully remove black people that are living with white people to be putting on what they call reserves, moving them out, strengthening pass laws, and basically doing everything they can to segregate blacks from whites. And then there's also coloreds, there's mixed race people that during that time period, it depended where you lived. Uh, coloreds could vote, they didn't have direct representation, but they had white representation in Parliament. But all of that's going to go away when we get to apartheid. Now, it's important that you kind of see this through the lens of World War II, because as World War II approaches in the 1930s, the people that are very nationalistic, the Boers, the Dutch, 
they're not very fond of the British. So they really don't want to go into World War II supporting the British. So an alliance occurs between the British population and the colored races to form what's called the United Party. And the United Party is going to jump into World War II, support the Allies, but there's unattended consequences. And one of those is there's a huge explosion during that time period of blacks that are migrating to cities for jobs because of the absentee whites that are going to fight the war. This is going to create racial friction. There's going to be a backlash. And that backlash is going to be seen in 1948 with the election of the National Party. This is a party that is very Dutch, Boer, nationalistic orientated, and they're playing on the fears of this large black majority that's going to conquer and take over this white minority. So they get elected, and now we have apartheid. So in 1948, guys, we get the election of the National Party, the Afrikaners, who are going to institute what is going to be called apartheid, literally separateness, apartheid. It's kind of like Jim Crow. If you know anything about Jim Crow, and we have a video, if you don't, it's in the description, but this is basically the social customs and political laws of the southern states in the United States in the first half of the 20th century. So this is much more centralized and much grander on uh, idea of really creating creating separate societies. We're going to get the Population Registration Act. This is going to divide the population into four categories, white, black, colored, and Asians, and into 13 racial federations where you got an ID. They had a commission or a board determine what race category you fell in. And that, when we get the Group Areas Act, is going to literally determine where you live. The grand idea is to take these reservations, which are from the British colonial times, and turn them into homes homelands and eventually independent countries of self-rule, but of course there is real no self-rule. Everything is being ruled through the NP, the South African government. The Prevention of Illegal Squattings Act gave the government the right to knock down urban areas in white cities and then basically, you know, move them out. Um, you got a pass if you could work in the city, but your family and everybody else would live in one of these homelands. There's going to be the Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act and the Immorality Act, which are going to ban any type of marriage or sexual relations between the different races. And then the Reservation and Separate Amenities Act, which is big time legal segregation. Segregation in public parks, in beaches, in restaurants, in hotels, in trains, anywhere there might be interaction, there's going to be separateness in this new policy. Policy. We're going to get the suppression of Communist Act, and the government used this to basically ban opposition. It's at the height of the Cold War, so if you were complaining about apartheid, you're probably going to be labeled as a communist, and we'll talk about the ANC in the next section of this video. And then we get the Bantu Education Act, which is creating a different educational service and law for blacks, coloreds, and Indians, which is much subpar to the white race. And then the Bantu Authorities Act and the Black Homeland Citizen Act is literally going to strip citizenship away from black people and force them into these homelands. And eventually the idea is to create these independent states. But of course, they're really not going to be independent. They're just going to be away from the white races. So apartheid is all encompassing. Every part of society in terms of where you worked, where you could work, where you lived, what language you spoke, what school you went to, who you could interact with, falls under the umbrella of apartheid. But luckily, not everybody is cool with apartheid. So now why don't we discuss some of the opposition as eventually we have to rid ourselves of this system of racial injustice. So the fiercest resistance to apartheid is going to come from the people that live within South Africa, internal resistance. Now, it's formed in 1910, South Africa. By 1912, we have the African National Congress, which is basically a resistance group to this new South African government, where they see themselves as not having any representation. So they're going to fight for themselves. And certainly with Gandhi in India, that's going to be a big message to lots of people in South Africa that they're 
there's a way to fight against this system. Now, when apartheid is enacted in 1948, immediately the ANC is going to try to replicate many of Gandhi's ways in something called the Defiance Campaign, where there's going to be boycotts and sit-ins and civil disobedience. But that's not going to be successful. And in fact, many in the ANC, they're going to create a youth league, which is going to be much more proactive. And eventually, that spins off into what's called the Pan Africanist Congress, the PAC, which is going to take a much more militant and aggressive stance against apartheid. Now, all of this is going to culminate in 1960 at a city called Sharpville, where 69 unarmed black protesters are going to be shot by the white police. This is really going to create the conditions for an escalation in the violence. Now, following Sharpville, the government's going to crack down big time. They're going to arrest 18,000 people. They're ban the ANC. They're going to ban the PAC. And then those groups are going to go really violent. Even Nelson Mandela, who's going to be awarded eventually the Nobel Peace Prize, took part in terrorist acts against people and government officials that supported apartheid. It was a group called the MK. That's going to get him arrested, arrested for sabotage, and he was even tried for treason, and get him his sentence where he's going to spend 27 years in jail and really become the Gandhi of that movement, even though Gandhi was all peaceful and Nelson Mandela is not exactly going to be peaceful all the time. By the 1970s, the ante is going up. There are more groups, the Black Consciousness Movement. One of their leaders, Steve Biko, is going to be beaten to death in 1977. And in 1976, we have a massacre at Soweto where hundreds of students were massacred by the white government. And at the same time, the groups that are opposing apartheid are now using terroristic methods in order to try to win the day as well. So internally, the civil disobedience isn't working. The terrorism really isn't working. So we're going to need some outside influence as well. Let's look at the outside opposition influences against apartheid. Internationally, there's not a lot of opposition to apartheid until we get to the 1960s. Now, in 1961, South Africa becomes a republic, and it wants to be part of the Commonwealth of Great Britain in order to get good trade relations. But the other countries that are part of that don't want anything to do with South Africa because of apartheid, so they have to withdraw from the Commonwealth. We have the United Nations following Sharpeville that is going to condemn apartheid in 1962, and then by 1963, they're proposing a voluntary arms ban against South Africa as well. And eventually there is going to be a call for countries to economically embargo South Africa. Now, the United Nations isn't able to do that because they have a Security Council where members have veto power. And Great Britain, under Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s, and the United States under Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, isn't going to allow that economic embargo to occur because they still see South Africa through the eyes of free trade. They call it constructive engagement, that the best way to get rid of apartheid was to engage with South Africa, not to embargo them, not to withdraw. And legislative groups within the United States, specifically Alex, they fought strongly to keep ties with South Africa. But as media increases and attention increases, there's a large calling that we need to stop doing business with South Africa. Not to mention other groups, such as the Catholic Church, Pope John Paul spoke vehemently out against apartheid. And international groups, sporting groups like the Olympics. The South Africans weren't able to participate in the Olympics since the 1960s because of their apartheid policies. I think the key internationally is to understand a lot of countries are seeing this through the Cold War. Certainly Great Britain and Reagan with the United States is seeing this as a Cold War conflict. The ANC are communists. The South African government is our ally. But as the Cold War ends and more attention turns to the human suffering and the human costs of apartheid, Apartheid, there's more pressure put on South Africa to change. Now, what did South Africa do as all this tension was rising? Did they retreat from apartheid in the 1970s and the 1980s? No, they doubled down. They even worked with Israel to get nukes into South Africa. That's how nervous Nelly they are. But again, by the late 1980s, the walls are coming down, the Cold War is ending, and there's a lot of pressure for South Africa to change, and it's going to take an election to do it. Wow.
So how did it end? It ended of their own accord. With the death of President Botha in 1989, the new president, F.W. de Klerk, is going to immediately take an aggressive stance that apartheid needs to end. He legalizes the ANC and the PAC. He immediately releases Nelson Mandela from prison. He starts negotiating with the ANC for an end to apartheid. They set up new elections, and by 1994, there is now universal suffrage, and there is a free election in South Africa, where the former prisoner and ANC fugitive, Nelson Mandela, is going to be elected president. And then there's a whole bunch of other stories that I could tell about the problems that they're going to have to fix. Oh my goodness. But we hope you understand the basic idea behind apartheid, who installed it, what it looked like, and eventually how it was opposed and how it fell down. So there you go. Your brain's a lot bigger. How about that, kids? Good for you. We hope that you watch lots of other videos. If you're not subscribed, I don't even know what you're doing. You should go do that right away. And I say it at the end of our lecture because I mean it with all my heart. Retention goes, energy flows. We'll see you guys next time you press my buttons.